So, you know what upsets me? How people act like Zidane was this natural talent who had it so easy, you know? They act like he came out of the womb wearing a Juventus shirt when really, he was already 25 when he first stepped foot in Italy. That's 8 seasons and 265 matches, but still, if you ask most football fans, they know nothing about it. If you're lucky, you'll get the same old story about how one year before his move to Turin, Kenny Dalglish had asked the owner of Blackburn to sign Zidane only for him to reply, why do you want to sign Zidane when we have Team Sherwood? And that's exactly where the problem lies. As one newspaper put it, though the world has now decided that he is unanimously great, Zidane was a hard code to decipher at first, as all one-of-a-kind footballers are. Zidane was weird. Forget the untrained eye, even the greatest talent scouts in the world could not see past what they claimed was. A lanky, sluggish midfielder with no personality or grit. Even Arsene Wenger, the same man who spotted some French kids struggling in Italy and turned him into the deadliest striker the Premier League had ever seen. Even he turned down Zidane when he was back at Monaco. In fact, for a long time, there were only a few people who seemed to truly realize the potential he had. You see, after France won the Euro 2000, most players just went about celebrating any way they could, but Zidane, the player of the tournament, the one who had carried them to glory, he drove down to Marseille because before he even went on holiday, he wanted to hug his mom. As a member of the French staff once said, Zidane is the superstar who could be your next door neighbor. In fact, his quiet, withdrawn, almost timid personality was one of the things that made his talent so difficult to spot. While most all-time greats seem to be these larger-than-life personalities, Zidane just wanted a hug from his mom. But that wasn't the point. What I meant to tell you was that, while he was down there, he got the news that a man named Robert Centenero was in the hospital struggling for his life and Zidane did not even think twice. He postponed his holiday and kept him company for what were the last few days of his life. But why was he so important to him? Well, back when Zidane was still Yazid, because believe it or not, he didn't like his first name when he was a kid, Centenero was the first person to scout Yazid, and even if the best he could do was take him to a tiny local club, Septem de Vallon, it meant a lot to him. As he would say, he did everything for me, he'd drive me to training, he would even give me money so that I could buy food on the weekends. He was like a father to me. And it was even thanks to Centenero that Yazid met maybe the only man who would have an even bigger impact on his career. Monsieur Varro. Only about a year after the two met, Centenero convinced Yazid to take part in a tournament organized by IS Khan, where schoolboys teamed up in hopes of getting scouted. But unfortunately for Yazid, he was benched. But just as it seemed he would not even get a chance to shine, the boy who was playing his position broke his wrist and was taken to the hospital. So Yazid took over his role and put down an immense performance. Only there was no one there to watch him. The scout on duty that day was the famous Monsieur Varro, and unfortunately for Yazid, he had offered to drive the injured kid to a clinic, so he never saw him. In fact, it took two years and three months for the two to cross paths again. And how did that happen? Well, Monsieur Varro was in the region to watch a trial for an interleague tournament, but then the player he was supposed to watch was benched, so he wandered around the premises until he spotted none other than the father of the boy that he had driven to the hospital years earlier, so the two got to talking while watching the kids play, until one stood out so much to Varro that he asked, who is number 13? And the man told him, that's the kid who replaced my son when you helped us, don't you remember him? His name is Yazid. By the end of that match, even though Yazid was not even picked by the organizers of the trial, Monsieur Varro was convinced he had spotted the next French great. As he said, he had hands where his feet were supposed to be. Just imagine if they had never crossed paths again. Regardless, not authorized to bring players to the club, Monsieur Varro convinced one of the directors at Cannes to come down to watch the kid, and in Yazid's own words, I remember that game. I wasn't too good. They played me all the way back in the fence, but I wanted to impress so badly, I risked everything. One time, I tried to pull off a sombrero in my own box, lost the ball and pretty much gave a goal away. I don't know what they saw in me that day, but in the end, they still wanted me. In fact, the director who watched him that day, Jean-Claude Elinot, wanted him at his club so bad that when his parents began insisting that they didn't want him living in an academy without proper parental figures around, he invited him to stay in the bedroom of his own son who had just left for the military, pretty much raising him alongside his two other kids. And let me tell you, as quiet as he was, that would be no easy task because, as we all know by now, Yazid had a temper.
If anyone ever dared mock his family or his origins in the ghetto, Yazid would not talk back. He would hit back. And indeed, it wasn't long before he was sent off for punching a player, but thankfully, again, he had someone by his side. As Jean-Claude told him, This is the curse of the gifted player. You will have to learn to ignore their words, or you will spend the rest of your life on the sidelines watching others play. If you need to let off some steam, just scrub the locker rooms or something. I don't know. That last part was supposed to be just a bunch of empty words, but Yazid took them literally. The next day, after everyone left, they found him there, with a bucket and a mop. As one of the coaches would say, Yazid was an example. He barely spoke, he always listened, and then he acted. However, Yazid was far from making it. When he got called up for the French under-17s, they even mixed up his name, addressing the latter to Sinkedri Zidane, that's how irrelevant he was back then. In fact, it would have probably have taken him ages before he made it to the first team, had it not been for Monsieur Varro yet again. As a senior team manager would tell the story, One day, Varro came, asked me to come see this kid training in the pitch next to ours. I kept telling him that I was tired, that I needed to go home, that I'd see him another time, but he insisted so much that even though I didn't want to, I gave it a look, and for 25 minutes, I could not take my eyes off of him. I was mesmerized. As I stood there, a board member walked by and said, You're looking at that under 18, huh? He seems really good. What he didn't realize was that Yazid was still only 16. From that day onwards, Yazid began training with the first team and only a few months later, he got his debut. In fact, when he got handed 5,000 euros of prize money for his first appearance, as he said it himself, it was five or six times more money than I had in my account, so I thought, this time, I'm gonna buy myself something nice. I went to the Levi store and got a new pair of pants. The rest, I sent to my mom. Regardless, that was the day I realized that I could go pro. And so, even when the board came in his way and pretty much banned the coach from playing him, calling Yazid a dancer, claiming that a team who was fighting to stay up could not be putting the club's fate in the hands of some kid, even saying that they weren't spending a fortune on wages just for the more experienced players to stay on the bench, even then, Yazid didn't budge. Every day from then on, he stayed behind in training, practicing his touch against the wall, and after a season without playing a single minute, they finally recognized his dedication, caved in, and let him play. And as he Ibrahimovic would go on to say, When Zidane stepped onto the pitch, the 10 other guys suddenly got better. It is that simple. It was magic. And that was exactly what happened. That year, Yazid finally became Zidane, and not only did Khan play the greatest league campaign in their history, but he was easily the protagonist. He even went as far as making sure that the only goal he scored, the first of his career, was named the goal of the year. A goal so impressive for a kid his age, that the president of the club even gave him a red Renault Clio as a reward, since after all, at that point, Zidane still didn't even have his own car. By the end, though it had been 44 years since Khan had last managed to even place in the league's top 10, suddenly they were in 4th place and had qualified for the UEFA Cup. And as you might imagine, this attracted a lot of attention, especially from Marseille, who not only was the Dan's childhood club, but had also just made it to the final of the Champions League. There was only one problem. At that point, Zidane was out on mandatory military service, and though they would still allow him to travel back and forth so he could play for his team, it wouldn't be until New Year's before he got discharged, so Marseille decided to wait it out, but unfortunately, by then, with Zidane having to split his time between the army and the club, Khan's performances dropped massively, being knocked out in the second round of the UEFA Cup and sitting all the way down below the relegation line. Suddenly, Zidane didn't look as appealing as before, so they began working out a deal where they would send Alan Boxic on loan to Khan so they could get Zidane for cheaper. But in the middle of it all, Leon got upset as they had just lost on a chance to sign Boxic being outbid precisely by Marseille, only for them to send him on loan immediately after signing him, which at the time was illegal. And just as they decided whether or not to sue them, Boxic just happened to debut precisely as Khan faced Leon and ended up getting their keeper sent off and costing them points, which sent them over the edge, leading them to take on the lawsuit, winning it, and getting all those deals cancelled. Meaning that by the end of the year, with Zidane struggling to get back in form, watching his own team get relegated and even picking up an injury, Marseille went back on their word and refused to sign him. Only a year after tasting glory for the first time, Zidane was back to being a nobody. But that's exactly when a miracle happened. 
With Khan struggling financially, Bordeaux's entourage met with them in an attempt to poach two of their players, Jean-Francois Daniel and Eric Guerry, but once the meeting started, the Khan representatives began naming all the players they were willing to let go of, and in the words of their manager, Rola Corby, once I heard the name Zidane, I began massacring the president's toes under the table. Five minutes later, for a small check of 3 million francs, we left with Zizou in our basket. Obviously, joining newly promoted Bordeaux was not even close to what Zidane expected from that season. I mean, Marseille were months away from winning the Champions League, but first of all, at least he was still at the top tier, and secondly, well, waiting for him in that locker room were two guys who would conquer the world alongside them. I'm talking about Christophe Dugarry and Bicent Lizarazu. The moment those three began joining forces, Zidane hit a whole new level. As one of the coaches at the club said, when he arrived, we saw an introvert, a kid who doubted himself, but with every single one of us around him, his confidence grew every day. We gave him the self-belief he needed to reach his potential. And Zidane, he knew this too. As he would one day say, Bordeaux was precisely what I needed in that moment, not just in football terms, but in my life. There, one way or another, I became a man. And by the end of the season, he had done it again. Bordeaux was somehow fourth in the league and had qualified for the UEFA Cup. Even more impressive, after insisting all year that he was not an attacking midfielder but actually a facilitator, Zidane was Bordeaux's top scorer with 10 league goals. In the next year, though he would have his first moment of madness punching Desai in the face midway through a match, then his score best Oliver Cannon led Bordeaux to revalidate their fourth place finish, meaning that by August, everyone had forgotten and his mistake. Not only was Zidane handed the league's Young Player of the Year award, but he was called up to the French national team for the very first time, and he made sure to make it as memorable as possible. You see, back then, France had not even made it to the previous World Cup, which was especially concerning, given that they were hosting the next one. And since they did not want to get embarrassed in their own turf, Aimé Jacquet had been handed the task of building a new side out of the wreckage of the previous squad. So that day, with Djorkaev out of the squad, he asked Zidane if he was ready for his debut and in his usually overly humble style, he told him that Corentin Martins was much better prepared for the match, so Jacquet left him on the bench. There was only a little problem. 60 minutes in, they were losing 2-0 to the Czech Republic. So, in a desperate attempt to try to keep France's pride untouched, Jacquet took the risk of sending Zidane in for Martins, and the result was simple. With 5 minutes to go, Zidane took the ball, made it past 1, then 2, and smacked it in from 30 yards out. As everyone expected the kid to lose his mind celebrating, he merely hurried back to the center of the pitch, because his mission wasn't over. That only came two minutes later when he leveled the match with a bullet header. As the cameras cut to the bench, you could see it in their faces. We found our man. Regardless, with Zidane struggling with recurring injuries the next season after a disappointing exit in the second round of the UEFA Cup, Bordeaux disappointed even further by dropping down to 7th place in the table. But as it seemed they would be out of the European competitions, they were handed a lifeline as the UEFA took over the Intertoto Cup and offered the winner a place in the UEFA Cup. In fact, it was right around that moment that Newcastle were supposedly offered the chance to sign Zidane for only £1.2 million, but as we all know, they did not take it. And quick Quickly, that proved to be a gigantic mistake. In the first match of the Inter Toto, Zidane scored a stunner only 6 minutes in, then 8 minutes after that, he got an incredible assist, and in the second half, not only did he start a counter-attack that led to their fourth goal, but scored the fifth through some real Zidane magic, and from there on out, he kept going, 3 free kicks scored over the next 3 matches, but once they were in the final, Zidane added a little bit of his usual flair, getting a 3-match ban for hitting another player with an elbow to the chin. Thankfully, that didn't stop them from winning the whole thing and, ironically, it was right around that time that Cantona was also serving his ban for Kung Fu kicking a fan and Zidane made sure to take advantage of his absence to completely cement his position as the new star of the French national team. Not just assisting the opener in their decisive qualifier against Aji's Romania but then scoring a stunner to secure their place at the Euros. But hey, if you think that was a beautiful goal, just hear me out. 
Once he had served his ban, the next round was against Real Betis, and not only did he score the winning goal, but the goal itself. Well, it was a 40-yard volley taken straight from a goal kick. If there was a Puskas award back then, he'd probably have won it. And still, it was nothing next to what happened in their quarterfinal match. So, look, that year, AC Milan somehow ended up in the UEFA Cup, which was especially impressive because they had been to the final of the Champions League in every single one of the previous three seasons, or if you prefer, they had been in five out of the previous seven finals. They were basically undefeatable. You could argue they were the scariest team since Di Stefano's Real Madrid, and to make things worse for Bordeaux, they lost the first leg to nil. As one newspaper wrote, Bordeaux and the UEFA Cup were just a palate cleanser to be dispatched before AC Milan returned to the high table to swill champagne around their gums again. In fact, Di Stefano's Real Madrid 44 years earlier had been the last team to beat them by three goals or more in the Champions League. There was no hope that Bordeaux would make a comeback, but then, well... Their players noticed that the Italians were far too relaxed during warm-up, so they went in with everything they had, and 14 minutes in, they were in front. Then, with every passing minute, it became more and more obvious that Zidane was the best player on the pitch, and by the hour mark, with a bit of help from the referee, he assisted Dugarry to tie the match. And only six minutes later, in at Magdesai, then glided across the pitch and made the impossible possible. 3-0 for Bordeaux, with the entire world watching. And once Zidane assisted Dugarry yet again in the very next match, pretty much putting them in the final, I'm guessing Lady Luck was done with them, since from there on out, everything went wrong. Both Zidane and Dugarry missed the first leg of the final through suspension, and even once they made it back, firstly Zarazu went out injured, and then they conceded through deflection. The final result was a 5-1 defeat on aggregate, but regardless, at 25 years of age, that run had finally been enough to convince the country of how great Sedan was, and so, even after getting involved in a car crash that left him seriously bruised from head to toe, struggling to get back to fitness, Aimé Jacquet did not even think twice. The league's new player of the year had to be at the Euros, and even through all of that, Sedan still got them within inches of getting to the final. But no matter what, once the market opened, Newcastle decided against signing him because they thought he was overrated, while let's say Sir Alex made the same poor judgement call because he didn't want to upset Cantona by signing another Frenchman. Regardless, Juventus, they believed he was the key to stop Milan's dominance so they decided to risk it, and once he signed the papers, you know we called first, Madame Elino. Two years later, he was the FIFA World Player of the Year and had taken Juventus to two Serie A titles and two Champions League finals. But I guess he was too slow, huh? 